Good evening, friends. I, uh, Dr. Pradeep Garge, welcome you all for this wonderful 14th webinar of National Journal of Homeopathy. This too shall pass. It's a virtual treatise on the renal stones. NJH is not only a journal, but it is an institution itself. As a part of NJH, everyone is benefited. Everyone learn some or the other thing which helps the practice. When you talk about a journal, that to a journal dedicated to a particular field, many thoughts come in mind. It's content, it's author bank, it's authenticity, it's print quality and many more. But when you talk about homeopathic field, only one name shines in the field of journal and that is National Journal of Homeopathy, which is popularly known as NJH. For almost 20 years, eight years, NJH has proved beyond doubt it's number one position in the field of homeopathy by publishing the journal regularly. Even in the odd situations of Corona lockdown, it was published online. Not only publication of journal, but NJH has offered regular upgradation of knowledge in the form of webinars. As you are aware, today's webinar is 14th webinar of this kind. As you know, to run a journal, it requires a lot of energy. It requires a lot of enthusiasm. It requires courage. It requires dedication, new ideas, and most important, a great team. But above all, it requires a visionary leader, a mentor. And NJH is fortunate to have such leader, such a mentor in the form of Dr. Vishpala Parsarthi. Since 1991, she is leading the team of NJH very successfully. I invite the editor in chief of NJH, Dr. Vishpala Parsarthi, to interact with you. Dr. Vishpala, ma'am, the web is yours now. Thank you very much, Pradeep. All of us uh, are together, and nobody, you know, one person can ever do anything very well. So, unless we have this team, which we call NJH team, almost 28 to 30 people, we are today on half of that 14th webinar. And uh, every number, as you know, has a significance. Today, I want to talk about number 14. The number 14, what is the most famous date that we all know, especially the young people, is February 14th, Valentine's Day. So it is, it is the day of love for everything. It doesn't mean love just of one tribe, but it means love for everything, including love of a person, love of a theme, love of a character career, love of the NJH. So, yes, so that is Valentine Day is celebrated every 14. You also have in France the national holiday, which is 14. Then you have in British pounds, 14 pounds make a stone. So I can go on and on and on. But uh, most importantly is that it, it is for us, NJH, it is beginning the second cycle of uh, webinars. We have done 14 and from now on we'll have, now we have 28 or 30 people in our team. So the, now we'll have repeat people from our very great, very dedicated team. What else we want to know about 14, which is very nice, is that in the moon, in the moon phases, you have 14 days of waxing when you have full moon and then you have the waning, which is, so that makes the cycle of 28. In tarot cards, it is the temperance. It is called the card of temperance and uh, <clears throat> it talks about control. So today's webinar is on lot of control because when you control and drink water, then you don't get renal stones, which is of today's mm -hmm. webinar. And when you are on dialysis, you have to control and not have too much water. So let us start with getting the blessings from the senior most person in our whole team and who joined us from day one of 1992 when our first journal came out, it was January month only, Dr. Kasim Chimthanawala, the doyen of homeopathy and of Nagpur. Sir, please say a few words of wisdom to us. Good evening, Dr. Vishpala. I am really happy to participate in this particular webinar, which is the 14th. And uh, she has said something about 14, a lot of things about 14. But what I will tell, directly coming back to NGH, rightly said by Dr. Pradeep, that National Journal of Homeopathy, 
doesn't sound very good. It is what is more important than NGH. Everybody knows NGH, and it has become really become a milestone for every learner, a student learner. I remember 25 years back when before that when I joined NGH when I was there, uh, the standard of the articles, the contributions by the editors. Let me tell you very frankly that the standard has increased a lot, and it has been able to stand to the today's thirst and requirements of uh, students because students have become very techy and uh, our materia medica type of practice has gone when we used to practice abstract method of method nowadays repertory is there so many types of repertory mac repertory supposed one of the best and the journal has got those cases which has got repertorized dr vishpalas cases many times have seen that you have to verify a remedy from three different methods <laughs> really very surprised to see that how could these three different methods are applied to select a remedy and coming to a single remedy confirming that remedy completely really appreciative and congratulative and i think uh, ngh is today um, one of the pioneers in homeopathic literature not only in our country but it seems abroad few uh, some some months back i was in uk even there when i saw that ngh is being talked at and because my name was there they said ke sir you are there on the ngh well, yes i was there i am there on the ngh and so i can understand that there are some people all over the globe who are uh, attached with ngh in some way or other particular in australia i will have no hesitations to uh, say that today ngh stands as one of the pioneer journals and one of the reputed journals a reliable uh writing on which every student should rely on and must have it on the table thank you very much thank you so much sir for those words they are really encouraging and will help us to go higher and higher in journalism so back to you pradeep yeah thank you thank you uh, kasim sir for your wonderful wishes and i am really uh, happy that uh, after a long time we are meeting again together and uh, now i will introduce you today's first speaker dr asrani sir through uh, though for ngs family he doesn't require any introduction but uh, for the newcomers and even for ngs family i am going to share some secrets of this great man dr asrani he has passed his uh, Uh, mbbs and then he has done dnb family medicine very few of this category all over india he is practicing for last 44 years and has many family and corporate clientele he offers both acute as well as chronic disease management preventive and digital consulting forms a large chunk of his practice he is one of the pioneer in wellness and preventive health information both on mass and uh, social media for last 18 years he is wellness enthusiast and he has on his name more than 200 facebook posts and blogs and more than 2000 tweets enlightening the knowledge of patients though uh, through inches group he is guiding doctors as well as patients as he thinks knowledge is wealth in less than 7 months you can you cannot imagine in less than 7 months 120 training hours they are there on his name he is recognized by the world bank and has been appointed as senior health insurance consultant to train the doctors of ayushman bharat by nature he is artist and you will be surprised to know that he has designed more than 100 cover pages of ngh and taglines of each of ngh issue is on his name you all also be surprised to know that he has command over six languages he knows marathi hindi english gujarati sindhi punjabi very well so during a meetings of ngh uh, we have a great feast of humor along with the knowledge he is a man of perfection and so always insist on upgradation he is always guiding how homeopath should be how he should collect data how we should present a case with proper analysis so that the world will accept it 
he has very clear concept about homeopathy and about homeopaths also he always analyze each case which is presented by a homeopath from the angle of science he puts the opinion very clearly but the intentions behind this are very clear and very pure always so dear friends i know you are eager to hear this multifaceted personality but before that request to all to follow certain rules of the webinar number 1 mute your audio as well as video we have got many 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 uh, video clips which are circulated in the uh, um, in the uh, social media which are very intimate and entertaining we don't want you to be part of parcel of that uh, uh, clips so put your audios and videos off no questions in between the webinar lectures put your all doubts and questions in the chat box only we will definitely try to answer it don't insert your clinic advertisement in the chat box you have a better option of putting your advertisement in nj journal itself you can get the details about it from our team so please once again request to mute your audios and hear to dr asrani sir please thank you pradeep i thought you will never stop <laughs> i had to literally hold the armrest of my chair otherwise i would have flown up in the air with ego no no these are all actually uh, thank you very much short points <laughs> so let's begin this too shall pass this is the assurance given by you a doctor to a patient who comes to you and says doctor i thought i am rid of my stones again pain again a 5 mm stone and the doctor with lot of confidence says this too shall pass you see the stone you see the water this is your job to dissolve it stone and let it go out through the patient's urine so let me begin today's webinar a virtual treatise on renal stone the 14th webinar and give you some insights of modern medicine and clinical medicine into better managing stone problems dr sushma will be talking about the homeopathic aspects and uh, she practices in my clinic i am fortunate that i have a good homeopath in my clinic and we handle all these cases together urinary stones also called calculi we never call them stone because you can't charge more money if you call them stone so is a calculi could be renal calculi ureteric or bladder calculi another bigger name is nephrolithiasis doc what do i got oh you got nephrolithiasis you can still charge more money so kidney stones or urolithiasis stones in the ureter these are the stones either forming or found or occurring in the urinary tract anywhere in the kub kidney ureter or bladder often the stones form when the urine becomes concentrated allowing minerals and salts such as calcium oxalate urates and phosphorus to crystallize and bind together let me take you back to your college days where you learned the physiology of the kidney kidney is working non stop and keeps filtering various salts and minerals in and out of the blood and because the flow of blood is very good these elements or minerals do not settle down they just pass through at times they crystallize bind together and form what is known as a sand initially when that sand becomes bigger it is formed a stone what are the clinical features the commonest feature is pain or colic colic is a pain of a smooth musculature which is trying to overcome a block a stone is commonly or usually silent 
you can have a 10 to 15 millimeter stone and patient has had no symptoms ever it is am i audible yes when the stone gets blocked the body tries to overcome that block and that is is the genesis of pain or colic the pain could be ureteric colic or renal colic depends on where the stone is this is the thing this is the classical spot diagnosis of a patient who tells you that this there is a excruciating severe pain which started suddenly severe sharp pain in the side the flank and in the back below the ribs never above the ribs above the ribs pain will be right side more likely to be liver gallbladder left side more likely to be stomach and spleen pain that radiates to lower abdomen and groin so when i see the patient holding that side or telling me i have pain here my first question is does the pain go down to the groin and if the patient doesn't understand groin i'll say does it go down to your testicles or penis or i tell a lady does it go down to the private parts and i have a confirmation of my suspicion pain that comes in waves and fluctuates in intensity this pain is not constant the patient in your clinic lying down all sweating will say doc now it is better and as he is talking to you he say oh my god it's come again because the body after pushing the stone relaxes for some time that is the time the pain is less and if there is infection then you have pain and burning while passing urine another question you ask this patient that from the time you have got this pain do you feel like urinating often and the answer will be yes even if there is no burning no pain while passing urine there will be a frequency of urination now see look at this this is the back this is the back the purple shade is of renal stone and the pink shade is of ureteric stone and see it's going down to the testicles or the groin a small stone may pass on its own causing little or no pain a larger stone may get stuck along the urinary tract anywhere it can get stuck it can get stuck in the kidney it can get stuck in the ureter at the junction of ureter and bladder below that in the bladder it doesn't get stuck because bladder has lot of volume so you do not get pain due to a bladder stone and this can block the flow of urine it's like you have a basin in your house wash basin enough dirt enough kachra goes on in the tube it blocks and you have retrograde flow of water that is what happens in this it blocks the flow of urine causing back pressure and this blocking causes pain as i explained to you the body is trying to overcome this block at times it causes bleeding this bleeding is not macroscopic it is not visible to naked eye it is microscopic and i will tell you how we use this to again diagnose before even a imaging is done and back pressure changes over a period of time the terms that you read in sonography hydro ureter or hydro nephrosis see this image this stone is blocked here this is the normal size ureter ureter and this is hydro ureter the back pressure changes have enlarged the ureter and there is another stone here which is causing the kidney to swell up hydro nephrosis even if this stone was not there and this lower stone was not treated this back pressure alone can cause the whole hydronephrosis so a mention of hydro ureter hydronephrosis in a sonography report means that you do not have much time to treat this patient with homeopathy 
you cannot tell him i'll wait for a year no all you have to do if this stone is 5 mm you have to reduce it by 2 mm a 3 mm stone will slide down once it reaches the bladder you are one so understand hydronephrosis hydrourethra you have to hurry up and then maybe a 3 monthly sonography report then other symptoms or clinical features are pink red or smoky urine very rarely you see red urine it will be pink urine or smoky brown urine very rarely frank blood but if the patient has pain also and patient passes frank blood the urine report shows blood 4 plus first rule out uh, renal cancer because stones rarely cause frank blood how the bleeding will occur wherever the stone is stuck stone is after all a very rough piece wherever it is stuck it irritates the inside of the ureter or kidney and from there bleeding occurs frank blood is very rare with stone cloudy or foul smelling urine if there is infection an infection of anaerobic bacteria a persistent need to urinate urinating more often than usual no i am not feeling persistent urge okay how often you pass urine in a day i pass every 3 hours how is it today today it is 1 and 1/2 hours so that is more than before or i am not able to pass urine fully that means the stone is down maybe in the penile urethra there is nausea and vomiting vomiting is a classical part so if the patient does not complain of pain looking at this patient absolutely prostrate and sweating and cold and clammy you may even think that patient has got a heart attack fever and chills if a infection is present then i'll tell you why there are silent stones see we showed you how the ureter is a small tube the ureter actually is the size of a ball pen refill so once the 5 or 10 mm stone can get blocked here these are the calices of the kidney these totally are known as pelvis of the kidney and these individuals are calices a stone here has enough space to grow big and does not block so renal stones generally like this stone is blocked here this will give pain this stone will not give pain what are the types why should we bother about type you may ask because i have to treat a stone yes but if you know the type you can give dietary advice and you can keep the ph of urine to help your treatment the stones are calcium stones calcium oxalate stones are the most common and they are caused by high calcium and oxalate excretion in the urine dietary factors high doses of vitamin d today people are taking vitamin d for years together intestinal bypass surgery due to some malignancy or tuberculosis and several metabolic disorders increase the concentration of calcium and or oxalate in the urine very rarely you may get calcium phosphate stones also and what is the type of stone you can only understand once the stone that has come out is sent for histopathology uric acid stones can form in people with those with diabetes and metabolic syndrome also can get more of uric acid stones because hyperuricemia is one of the feature of metabolic syndrome rare ones are struvite stone they are observed only during urinary tract infections they are termed as struvite stone they are very big in size commonly found in women they can grow quickly and become quite large sometimes with very few symptoms and may require surgery it's caused by a particular bacteria called proteus mirabilis which is urea splitting i'll not go in the details of how it causes but it is a mechanism of urea and ammonia which helps cause truvite stones keeping our patient infection free you have a lot of patients who today may not have a stone but they are coming to you for recurrent uti 
your mind should tell you that this patient can get a stone and I have to prevent it. Cystine stones. These stones form in called cystinuria. Cystine is a amino acid and these people excrete too much of cystine. That's why they get stones. What are the causes or risk factors? Causes, as I told you, the elements or minerals are getting crystallized. Then who are at risk or what are the causes? Let's combine both. Personal family history. My personal history, how much water do you drink? And most people will tell you, no doctor, I drink water. No, you want to know how much because you want to capture that data. Two liter, one and a half liter, two and a half liter, three liter. And then if somebody says, I drink four liter, you have to ask the counter question. Are you drinking 20 glasses of water? No, 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 not 20. I drink eight glasses. So make sure you are getting the facts correctly. Family history, sometimes stones run in families because generally habits also run in families. And personal history, you have a patient with renal calculus. You have to ask, did you have this before? Ever before? Yes, I had it eight or ten years ago. Dehydration is the risk factor. Age. The peak incidence is between 40 and 60 years of age. Gender. Think back of all the patients of yours of urinary stones and you'll see more are males. Sushma, you should confirm this whether you had more males or more females. Obesity. High BMI. Large waist size. And weight gain have been linked to increased risk for stone formation. Geography. The prevalence of stone disease is higher in hot or dry climates, such as mountains, deserts, and tropical areas. Like I had been to Uttarakhand for a holiday, and I was told virtually everyone there has calcium oxalate stone because the water also is very rich in calcium. Certain diet, high protein diet, already told you, people who consume more salt and sugar also are at a risk of some type of stones. Digestive disorders and surgeries, gastric bypass surgery, the bariatric surgery, it affects the metabolism very badly and people get stones. Inflammatory bowel disease like ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease or chronic diarrhea can cause an increasing amount of stone forming substances in urine which crystallize and form stones. Other medical conditions such as cystinuria, hyperparathyroidism, or repeated UTI. Certain supplements, calcium-based antacid. People who consume liquid antacids like digene or gelustil, they contain a lot of calcium. And people who consume that like Coke or Pepsi do get calcium stones. How do you diagnose? High index of suspicion. My clinical knowledge should tell me this is a stone. Pain in the flank coming from back to the front till the navel or coming down to the groin. Similar past history. Routine urine. This is a clue I am giving you. If the patient is in your clinic, always keep a few bottles for urine examination in your clinic. Even if you don't have a lab connection, tell the patient the first urine the patient passes after an acute attack of pain, if it shows occult blood and few RBCs, that pain is because of a calculus stuck there. That is my diagnosis. Before even I do a sonography, I have a diagnosis of confirmed diagnosis of urinary stone. Imaging. In imaging, we do plain x-ray. Plain x-ray has one problem that all stones are not radio-opaque. Calcium-containing stones are radio-opaque. You will see them. Calcium oxalate plus minus calcium phosphate or triple phosphate struvite. They are usually opaque. Radiolucent stones are uric acid stones, cysteine stones. And there are stones caused by a drug. Indinavir is a medicine given for HIV patient. So if you are treating HIV patient and that patient has a stone, then you think it could be a stone-related medicine that is a radiolucent stone never seen on plain x-ray. Then we have ultrasound. It is usually the first investigation done nowadays. And it's often able to identify calculi either directly or indirectly. 
directly means it will show you that there is a stone. Sometimes if the stone is radiolucent, but the stone has caused hydrourethral or hydronephrosis, it can still show you that there are changes of hydrourethral scene. There is a block, and that block is likely to be calculus. Small stones and those nearer corticomedullary junction are difficult to reliably confirm. Ultrasound compared to CT KUB, CT scan of kidney, urine, bladder showed a sensitivity of only 24% in anatomical calcula, but we cannot send every patient for a CT scan of the urinary tract. Nearly 75% of stones not visualized on ultrasound were less than 3 mm. So again, I have to see that a patient has symptoms, ultrasound is negative, x-ray is negative, but my clinical diagnosis is strong. Yes, I may go for CT scan. On CT, almost all stones are opaque. And they also vary in density. So a good CT machine can tell you whether this stone is calcium oxalate or uric acid or struvite or what. Two radiolution stones worth mentioning even on CT scan. Indinaver stones... This is again a drug I told you for HIV. 20% patient using this drug get these stones and these are not visible even on CT scan. And second is a pure matrix stone which is made solely of protein. Common in females, history of UTI, chronic renal failure and or hemodialysis. So how is this is done? You have a very strong suspicion. Patient is getting occult blood. Patient is getting recurrent pain. Then you put undergo a surgery, I'll tell you ureteroscopy, there you pick up a stone and when the stone is sent for histopathology, you can make out it is a matrix stone. Then we have a dual energy CT. These are, I'm just telling you, academic interest, we don't use it much. Allowing the composition of the calculus to be determined. It has also been shown to predict the success of extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy. CT IVP, CT urogram. Olden days, we used to do intravenous pyelography. A dye was injected and a series of x-rays were taken to see the flow of urine and the stone was seen there. Now we do that CT with IV contrast. It helps diagnose not only stones, but several other disorders of urinary tract. See, this is the picture. The image on the left side is a IVP where a dye has been injected. You can see dye in the bladder. And this is where, see, this is the block here. And this is hydrourator and hydronephrosis. The same thing you can see in a CT scan here. How do you manage? Management, Sushma will talk. Conserve window management, I want hydration. I want to give my patient hydrotherapy, at least three liters of water a day. If my patient drinks alcohol, I will say drink two big bottles of beer a day because that will give amazing amount of diuresis. Avoid list will tell you about calcium oxalate stones and uric acid. You have to give an avoid list to patient. Supportive management. Now, this is something new that I'm giving you. The formation of renal stone is related to the urine pH. So, a routine urine test where you see for occult blood and look at the pH. What is the significance of pH? Patient being treated for renal calcula are frequently given diets or medications to change the pH of urine so that the kidney stones will not form. Calcium phosphate, calcium carbonate and magnesium phosphate stones develop in alkaline urine. When this occurs, urine is kept acidic. I have to keep the urine acidic. If you have remedies, please give. Otherwise, tell a patient to drink two glasses of lime juice. No sugar, no salt. Twice a day, one glass twice a day. That is enough to keep the urine acidic. Uric acid, cysteine and calcium oxalate stones precipitate in acidic urine. In this situation, the urine should be kept alkaline or less acidic than normal. 
here we have medicines but i will not mention the names here diet fruit and vegetables provide magnesium potassium fiber citric acid that is associated with reduced stone risk so all stone patients have to be given more of fruits and vegetables make sure patient's diet contains a sufficient amount of calcium about 1 gram a day the commonest myth which many doctors support urine says calcium oxalate crystal seen and the patient asks doctor i think i will stop milk because it is calcium and doctor agrees no low calcium will promote stone formation i need to give you calcium supplements i need to give milk yogurt cheese or at least two tablets of 500 mg of calcium per day dietary calcium restriction is not needed as calcium restriction increases the risk of stone formation give more foods which have a low oxalate content eggs lentils peeled apples and cauliflower have low oxalate content and will prevent what contains more oxalate reduce the amount of salt canned soups have more salt canned vegetables have more salt salty snacks chips farsan added salt table salt or spices to be avoided high salt intake increases urinary calcium and decreases urinary citrate which is associated with increased stone risk restrict food containing excess of oxalate beetroot sweet potato nuts dark chocolate spinach black tea in this the commonest one is see beetroot even the people may eat one or two pieces i must still allow spinach i will totally stop limit intake of animal proteins organ meats like brain liver kidney red meat goat meat beef or pork till i am sure which stone my patient has i tell the patient stop red meat and stop spinach and maybe methi if you take it often and stop red wine then once i am sure what the stone is once it has come out we know now it is uric acid then i can give the patient spinach and methi then every time you may not be successful or the patient has severe hydro ureter hydronephrosis please understand the back pressure over a period of years can cause the kidney to stop functioning i had a patient once who came to us he had a stone which was blocking in the renal pelvis and he is on a isotope scan one side of kidney was not functioning at all fortunately his creatinine was normal because one tenth of one kidney is enough we were not sure whether that kidney is gone forever or it will come back but when the stone was surgically removed urine started flowing we could see it on table and the kidney function returned to normal <coughs> so if you have a patient who has a long history and a bad hydronephrosis please check creatinine level so what are the surgical managements of removing stone extra corporeal shock wave therapy non surgical approach breaking the stone through the raise this technique is preferred for kidney stones smaller than 2 cm 2 cm i am not talking not i am talking of 2 mm and ureteric stones larger than 10 mm in size in this shock waves are focused on stones and they are fragmented the fragmented stones are passed through urine we insert a instrument called dj stent so these all stones come to the bladder and from there they are passed out see this is the person lying down this is the machine and this is from here the shock waves are sent to crush the stone second one is a stone in the kidney which is not ideal for eswl per cutaneous nephrolithotomy in the olden days for a kidney stone removal they would open up the kidney there would be a 15 to 16 inch scar 
from back to front nowadays with the smaller instruments available we go through the skin of the back just lateral to the spine and remove the stone percutaneous means going through the skin nephrolithotomy opening the kidney and removing the stone this procedure is preferred for renal stones larger than 2 to 3 cm in size an instrument called nephroscope is passed through the skin into the kidney and stone is fragmented and removed see this this is the back it has gone in the kidney nephroscope ultrasonic probe and they are crushing the stone and letting it come out ureteroscopy scopy is a part of examination but it has therapy also ureteroscope is passed through the urethra and bladder into the ureter it is preferred for ureteric stones larger than 10 mm in size small stones are removed and large stones are fragmented fragments are again then removed through the scope or passed through the urine see this this is the stone we have gone through the urethra through the penis urethra gone into the ureter and then we have gone beyond the this is the stone i have gone beyond the stone i am holding the stone opening my basket and pulling it down if the stone is big i cannot pull it down so i fragment it and then i remove that that is all my part of the treatise please give your questions i will answer at the end of this program dr garge and dr brushali i think i have been in time okay yes definitely sir and uh, thanks a lot sir for your wonderful uh, speech and uh, you have guided us very nicely uh, rightly how to treat these cases of renal calcula in very scientific way So thanks a lot those